Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is General Chris Adams. I served about eight years in the headquarters, and I believe from what I observed that being a general officer in SAC was infinitely more demanding than being a general in the other major commands. A SAC general had to know missiles, bombers, tankers, command and control, and reconnaissance. Additionally, SAC generals had to operate both in the nuclear and the non-nuclear worlds. Our next speaker, Major General Chris Adams, exemplifies those traits. A bomber pilot and a missile combat crew commander, he was the perfect fit as a SAC XO and the director of the PSYOP. Like most of us, General Adams is an unreconstructed cold warrior, yearning for the clarity of that era and an enemy we could trust. Ladies and gentlemen, insider's view of the Cold War from Major General Adams. Thank you very much for the kind words. I uh, get Peck stuff out of here, start fresh. I don't know what I can say. I, uh, I reviewed the agenda and uh, saw myself following the likes of Generals Doherty, Dick Lawson, Earl Peck, and one thought came to my mind. That's Tom Clancy's book a few years ago, The Sum of All Fears. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm especially honored to be on the program with such valiant uh, cold warriors that I was so privileged to serve with and, and for. And how time flies. Uh, Jim McCoy reminded me last night that he and I both have birthdays this month and we roll into our seventh decade. And that's just damn scary, I can tell you. I, uh, I, I didn't even thought about that. People keep reminding me and, uh, and sure enough, it's here. I want to congratulate or add my congratulations to, uh, to Leo Smith for the founding of this great society. Uh, he pulled it all together. It was his idea. Got a few guys together in the bar uh, over at Offit and uh, got this thing rolling about nine years ago now, I guess. And uh, Ed Birchfield jumped in there and has done yeoman service. And then Rob Hoover for this great uh, symposium. So thanks to all of you again. I know you're getting a lot of accolades, but I'm not sure uh, that they really match. But if you look at this room uh, this morning and last night of the folks that have come back home to Omaha and home to SAC, I think you realize what, uh, what you have done for us, and we really appreciate it. Uh, I was glad to see uh, Admiral Rich Meese with us last night. I have a fond affinity for the Navy. I spent six years in DASA DNA and then three years in JSTPS, so I have more Navy flag uh, fitness reports in my file which probably saved my life uh, in the Air Force than, than I do Air Force uh, flags. Uh, but I have a story to tell about Rich. I, a few years ago, back in the last century actually, at least it was in the 1900s, I was in JSTPS and I was over in Washington one day and I, I, went, I went to the Pentagon and went did bop him up to the uh, uh, Air Force Protocol Office to capture a telephone and a desk for a few minutes between meetings. As I made a hard uh, turn uh, into the Protocol Office, General, uh, uh, Jack uh, Ryan was sitting there, uh, long since retired, a dapper a sport jacket, and I said, hi, General, how are you? Chris Adams, and I was going to pass on by, and he said, where do you work? And I said, well, I'm out in Omaha. What do you do out there? And I said, well, I'm in JSTPS. Sit down. So I, I sat out a minute. He said, I'm going to tell you what I tell every general and every sink that's been out in Omaha uh, since I left there, and that is, watch that damn Navy. He said, <laughs> said one day. If we aren't careful, don't get the head under the tent far enough, and you guys are going to be out in the desert. And I said, yes, sir. He said, when you go back, you tell Dick Lawson one more time. I'm just reminding you. So I did. Well, uh, fast forward to 1998, and I was up here for my former exec's uh, retirement. Gene Habiger retired from being the sink, and, uh, and Rip, uh, Rich Meese became the uh, commander in chief of U.S. Stratcom. And, uh, our current chief of staff was here, Mike Ryan. So I walked over and I got him for a corner. And I said, Mike, I want to tell you a story about your dad. And so I told him this story and he, he listened and finished. I said, in about two hours, I said, there's an admiral going to walk upstairs, going to 2A1, going to sit down in your dad's chair. And I just want to tell you, I'm, I've told everybody else and I'm warning you, but it's probably too late. So, <laughs> but I've enjoyed working with Admiral Me uh, Meese. I've been on the SAG for the last four years, two under General Habiger and, and two under uh, 
uh, rich, and I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. One of the uh, legacies of Strategic Air Command was the Strategic Advisory uh, Group. It's still here. Uh, it still works policy. It still works planning. And still, uh, uh, excluding myself, has about 30 uh, uh, geniuses from uh, our country who are willing to serve, work, and, and participate uh, in the SAG. I, I wish we could get more out of it, but uh, we don't. General Doherty mentioned uh, a book, and I, I did uh, dash off a thing a few years ago, and uh, he has a copy, thank God. Actually, he has General Jones's copy. Uh, that book is actually chapter five, uh, General Doherty, and I thought I said, I know I sent you one, and I signed it, uh, of a thing I began a few years ago. Uh, I have a had a fascination with history most of my life. It's probably why I was a poor student and maybe a, a poor uh, Air Force officer and everything else. But history, to me, lies in the fact that, uh, that people make it. And uh, my 30 years in, in Strategic Air Command and the, and the blessings I've had since uh, uh, redeemed all those things with me. And I uh, uh, made some 23 trips to Russia, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, the, former, uh, the Soviet Union, then the former Soviet Union over about a five-year period, but I was back in uh, 1994, and my wife and I were out in Ruidosa, New Mexico. We have a small place out there, uh, and I was taking some respite from uh, long travels. I picked up the Albuquerque Journal one morning, and there was an article in there that uh, stated that there were several business education industry leaders uh, had participated at a national security forum. But what caught my attention was a little block inset and I read that, that to draw the attention to the article. And it said, and I quote, we didn't win the Cold War. Thank God we didn't have to fight it. Well, I studied that for quite some time. Uh, I recognized immediately the, the author. Uh, I won't mention his name because he's still around. He has an ambassador in front of his name, but I worked with him for a long time. And I thought, this is the most absurd thing I've ever, in, ever heard or ever read. We didn't win the Cold War. Thank God we didn't have to fight it. So I sat down and wrote my first letter to the editor, the Albuquerque Journal, and a couple days later, someone from the paper called me and uh, verified who I was. They published it the following Sunday. And uh, so I got out of the writing the letters to the editor out of that. Uh, when you have success, you quit while you're ahead, and I haven't written any more. But I got back to Dallas, and a few days later, I received in the mail a copy of a book written by Alvin and Heidi Toffler, War and Anti-War. And I had just a small part of that book over page 132. If you haven't read it, my name's in there. But anyway, uh, they sent me an autographed copy. But what captured me was a statement that the Tofflers had concluded in the opening paragraph. Today, the, ter the term Cold War already has a quaintly archaic ring. Well, I thought about that for a while, and I said, good grief. What did I do for 30 years and six months in the Air Force, 20 of that in Strategic Air Command, and what did all of of my colleagues do during that time. And I began to uh, think about that quite a bit. I was doing a lot of shuttling between Dallas, Moscow, and, and other garden spots in the world, and I uh, had had the opportunity to visit with a lot of folks over there. I certainly uh, knew my side of the business, I thought. And so I created an outline of what I thought I wanted to do. I wanted to create something and, and put a, a face on the Cold War, but it, more importantly, I wanted to put a face on the Cold Warrior. And so I sent out about 50 queries to, uh, to many cold warriors that I had served with and knew well, and some that I didn't know, and received out of those 50, probably 40 back, very positive uh, responses, a lot of guidance and counseling from the likes of General Russ Doherty. Earl Peck sent me a, a voluminous book to uh, quote from, as long as I got his name correct. And, uh, uh, Bob Harries probably gave me the most sage advice is that don't try to take on an H.G. Wells novel, History of the World. Uh, keep it concise, and it may be too big for all of you. Well, I sent Bob a copy not long ago, and he agrees that I didn't try to do it. But the point is, uh, this little thing here is a 200-page uh, monograph. Uh, it has a different title than I put on it because the editor thought it ought to be different. But this actually became chapter five of a thing. I started writing it first, and then I decided uh, this thing is so good that I'm going to write the front and the back of it. So I set out writing this thing and drove my wife crazy. I still am with regard to trying to, uh, to put my arms around what I thought we were here fighting for and what we were here serving for. And I uh, 
went into a deep research uh, about every lab library I could uh, reach and touch in the world. Uh, Wright-Patterson has one of the best in the world up at AFIT. And uh, a couple of those with some experiences I had, a lot of airplane traveling, traveling back and forth. And I began with a thesis that the Soviet launched Cold War, orbited the free world much like a menacing Sputnik for more than four decades before exhausting its energy, eroding, uh, losing its momentum and eroding its perpetrator into virtual collapse and chaos. And I remember uh, distinctly my first trip to Moscow when it was still, uh, uh, Leningrad was still there, the Cold War was still on, and uh, our hosts in Moscow took us, took three of us, myself and two colleagues from the company. Uh, well, first of all, let me tell you this, going into uh, Moscow in those days as a former military guy in civilian clothes with a, with a civilian passport is a sporty course. My two colleagues brushed right through immigration, and I'm convinced I stood there probably no more than five or ten minutes. It's seemed like an hour and a half. Uh, some bells rang. Other guys came in in uniform, looked at me. And when you walk through, uh, everybody, most everybody here has probably been to Russia since, but you go through immigration there, it's a humbling experience. The, the windows up here, you look up at these guys, you know, they want to get a, and a mirror behind you and all that. But anyway, that, that's not the, uh, the gist of my story, except for intimidation, humiliation, and what have you. It, it got better over time as I finally earned or gained a, a permanent visa, and I could run back and forth as I wanted to. But that first day, uh, our host took us out on an August evening to Red Square after a very sumptuous dinner, and, and it was a, a musky evening. Uh, the, uh, uh, the clouds were, were low and moving about. It was warm. The lights in the Kremlin were, were reflecting against the haze. And I walked around on the bricks there. The, the guards were goose-stepping back and forth uh, in front of uh, Lenin's mausoleum. And one of my friends and our colleagues from the company came over and said, well, Chris, what do you think about this based on what you've been doing in most of your life and what have you? And I said, well, first of all, I, I had goosebumps when I first stepped out here. But I said, the more I think about it, I really wonder if the young guys back in the United States sitting on bomber alert and the guys in the missile capsules know I'm here because I forgot to tell them. And uh, I'm not sure it's a very safe place, a la Earl's comments with regard to, uh, to uh, Leningrad. But for the many years that I served on a SAC crew uh, in bombers, and then I was very fortunate to, uh, to go the uh, capsule education program over to, uh, to the Minuteman, and then as a wing air division commander, and finally uh, five and a half winters in Omaha, as in JSTPS and on the staff. Uh, my comrades, and I use that term affectionately, I learned to use it quite well in, in uh, Russia. My comrades and I never doubted the importance of our responsibilities, nor do we ever question that the Soviet threat was, was real. Nor did I ever doubt that our counter threat was equally real. In, in retrospect, I think we're often uh, prompted to look back in time and rec reflect upon what made us do certain things or what certain things happened in our lives. And no one really ever indoctrinated the combat crew, I don't think, in my time, to the extent of, of telling us what the genesis of the Cold War was or who the Soviet enemy really was. Some military staff development courses, of course, at Maxwell attempted to do that, but, but I think in some uh, it was fairly, fairly lightly done. But I want to tell you it was by no means the same with the Soviet warfighter an opportunity to meet a lot of those guys. I, and I want to interject, I never met a communist after I started going over there in 1990 all the way through 1995. Never met one. I'm telling you, you talk about disavowing and running from it. Uh, uh, was incredible. Actually, I collected about 25 or 30 communist uh, membership cards. They're for sale at most of the, uh, at the kiosk for a dollar a piece. I brought a lot back and inserted pictures of some of my best friends in them and, and sent them to me. <laughs> and, uh, got a, a kick out of it, but I don't want to make folly of our former adversary. I, uh, I have a lot of anecdotes. I'll tell you one in a few minutes, uh, one of my very favorite and special ones. But the Soviet warfighter was every bit as zealous and uh, as dedicated as we were. Uh, the main approach was how they went about doing it. Uh, young kids at uh, Cub Scout age uh, were forced to join the Young Pioneers on up through Komsomol, which is about the Boy Scout age, and then into conscription or officer candidate school or, 
what have you. I tried to cover a lot of that in this little book because I, I became fascinated with who our enemy was and what the guy looked like on the other side. I, I know a lot of the saints felt like that their photograph was over in the, in the Kremlin as was uh, their counterparts over here and I always felt uh, that same way as our guys down in the underground were picking targets to put uh, just the right size bomb on uh, in the various uh, locations of the Soviet Union. But I can tell you that, that, that the young Soviet knew who the enemy was. There's no question in his mind. Uh, they were drilled to hate the West, and Americans in particular. I, I found out some of that. I, I was gonna say a, a moment ago, uh, in fact, there's not a lot I can tell you about after, uh, after Dick and, and Earl uh, regaling uh, all the experiences of SAC. But uh, I was gonna comment a moment ago about the first trip in there. I remember Winston Churchill making a statement in 1946 about the concern for the Russians. And he's, at the end of World War II, he said, it's a rubble pile, a charnel house, and a breeding place for pestilence and hate. Well, in 1990, I found about the same thing. It really was a rubble pile. Uh, it's more of a charnel house than it was then because they had discipline, they don't have it now. But the hate's gone, I think truly so. And the Russian, if I were to look out amongst you, I could add uh, Sutorov to your name, or I could add Kaminsky to your name, or I could, because we all look about alike. You know, we're all Anglo, and uh, I, I don't want to tell you that I'm a disciple of the, of the Soviets, but I, do, I did uh, make a lot of friends in Ukraine, in Kiev, in Minsk, and what have you, and, and learned to appreciate the plight that those poor folks had. But with regard to the Soviet warfighter, uh, those young guys and gals did not serve willingly. Uh, coercion and conscription was the way of life. You can walk around Moscow today, or, in, or particularly the small towns, outside, out in Kazan, out on the Transib uh, Railway, and you'll find more crippled folks that weren't necessarily crippled in war but crippled from self-mutilization, from self-mutilation. Uh, it was not unusual to cut a tendon in your leg, in your heel, in your arm, anything to immobilize you and to keep you from serving. And I had more than one uh, Soviet tell me that, or one former uh, Soviet tell me that over time. Uh, I don't think we appreciated on this side. I don't think we appreciated uh, the great American warfighter. At least I don't think America at large did. You did, I did, because we were here and we served and always marveled at the, at the tens of thousands uh, that, that came and served and uh, their sons came on to serve. General Doherty was telling me last night that he, uh, he and, <coughs> and Barbara just visited uh, Didi over in, uh, in Mon and uh, his son Lado now heads up all the NATO forces. Uh, that's a legacy. Uh, Tom Keck, son of, uh, of Jim and, uh, and Bobby is a commander of 8th Air Force. Uh, Peck's son is over heading up the uh, U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia. So that's a part of the great warfighter, Cold Warrior legacy when we see sons of sons. I spoke a couple of weeks ago, I was telling General Doherty, I had an opportunity to, by phone for another reason entirely, to, to talk to uh, Paul Tibbetts, pilot of the Noel Gay. Uh, still very vibrant on the phone anyway. I was talking to him. His grandson is a B-2 pilot uh, down at Whiteman. Another part of the great legacy of the, of the Cold Warrior. Well, I began to put this thing together and I wanted to trace more than just putting a face on the Cold Warrior. And I put a lot of your faces in there, by the way. Uh, some of you who have read the book have seen your name and faces with, I, I hope, with, uh, with honor and appreciation of what I attempted to do. But I, I felt if I was gonna do something and a lot of time on my hands and uh, with a laptop, I attempted to trace the, the ideological history of Russia. Uh, the 340 years, if you will, 100 years older than we are by far, 340 years occupation by the Mongols and then the Tsars for another uh, 500 years, then communism, then the Soviet Union. 1,100 years of a, of a really a, a dreadful and brutish human plight all in contrast to our brief 224 years or whatever we are right now uh, of an evolution of, of a democratic process. We've had our bad times, we certainly have. We've had wars and we've had uh, other things that bothered the Civil War in particular, but nothing to compare uh, with the plight 
of the folks in Russia and then later uh, the 70 years of, of communist uh, rule. I tried to re review uh, World War II, a, truly a victory without peace because World War II was no sooner over 1946, we were back into, uh, uh, into heavy conflict. There was Stalin's war, we went through the early cautious years of George Kennan and, and Truman's containment policy, Eisenhower's new look, the missile gap, flexible response, detente, and finally, calling it what it was, the evil empire uh, by Ronald Reagan. So the overall essay really attempts to uh, critically review uh, and an analyze the Cold War policies, not only the Truman Doctrine, uh, but the Reagan assault on the evil empire, which brought it uh, really to a close. And I try to describe how the U.S. and Soviet policy, policy uh, ambiguities uh, that bothered us, the politics of politics, if you will. And believe it or not, all the way from Truman uh, to George Bush, the policy was quite consistent. Avoid direct confrontation with the Soviets, contain communism, and attempt to give the Americans an acceptable quality of life. And I think all three of those uh, were met by all the presidents we had. We fought the Cold War under nine presidents, from Truman to Reagan. The Soviets had seven leaders, from Stalin to Gorbachev. That's not a small snippet of history, and when I read things that tend to uh, skate over this or make statements such as we didn't fight it, much less win it, uh, it, it, really, uh, it, it really takes it to heart for me, uh, not only as a, uh, as a former Cold Warrior, but also one that uh, has had the privilege and the pleasure to, uh, to travel around the world and, and see the other side. And yet, uh, as we went through this process, we had tens upon tens of thousands of young American men and women step forward, wore the uniform, they trained, they became professionals, proficient in operating and maintaining the most complex weapon systems of all time, all for faith in the country and an obvious love uh, for the United States and a conviction that it was essential and the right thing to do. Our work was rewarding, you remember that, every one of you. Uh, the rewards were very few. Sometimes just a good landing was something to go home and feel good about. <laughs> or, a good, uh, or to get a shack, those things came uh, few and far between, at least on my crew. But nevertheless, uh, we were there, we served with pride. We had our own characterization for what that pride was and what that fulfillment was. The extended separations from family, TDY, away from home, overseas exercises, and just plain long days and, and work weeks, uh, long weeks. They were the norm, but they went with the territory, and we seemed to move right on with it. Uh, families suffered a great deal, but nothing again. I, I really want to emphasize this comparative analysis of what the great life we lived, no matter how arduous you thought your duty was, well, that poor slob sitting over in, uh, in Kiev or Minsk or outside Moscow or, or manning some silo over there, because let me tell you, uh, duty uh, wasn't good. But yet we, uh, they did it and we did it in spite of what I've characterized as roller coaster politics, some inconsistent policy and sometimes even lunacy in the way we did business, and yet we moved through it. It was a loyalty and dedication of the American coal warrior, but sacrifices, unstinting devotion to duty and country, and something we don't hear very much anymore, and that's patriotism uh, that carried us through. It sustained us and preserved our freedoms throughout this 45-year conflict. It was kept in check by just those things that I've characterized, and we had the will to persevere and to see it through, even sometimes if we're ignored by uh, what I've characterized as pseudo-elite civilian entities that frequently didn't respect nor trust the military. And I remember going out and making talks back during the Cold War days, sent out by the, by the sink of the chief of staff at different places and talking to groups, and, and we pounded the Soviet threat. We went over and over about the Soviet threat. We preparedness, nuclear deterrence, how important it was to have weapon systems, how important it is that we maintain uh, our strength. And it puts us in another another world today as we go and talk. I spoke to a, a, an optimist club last week in, uh, outside of Fort Worth, about 150 folks, and uh, I guess I was, I, I'm inspired when I go speak to these groups because they listen to you and they hear 
what you're saying, but, don't, but it's difficult to get that point through again. I mean, we've relaxed these last nine years, and it's tough to get that engine going again. I spoke to a, a, a high school, uh, well, first of all, my high school uh, senior group, about 600 kids, uh, a couple of years ago. I got set up in that by the principal of the high school, by the way. There were about 600 kids there. I didn't realize we had a Ukrainian exchange student and a Russian exchange student in the group, and I was lambasting uh, both groups pretty severely. <laughs> kids came up afterward, and I wish I'd known better because I, I had a lot of apologies. But nevertheless, I, I didn't apologize a great deal, you know. Hell, we won the war. And, uh, <laughs> but my point is, I, I talked to these young kids, glassy-eyed and, uh, and, and really not, not grasping. But I, I moved that forward to just this past November to a group of seniors at, uh, at A&M, and uh, it was a week of the, in November, the week of the uh, 10th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I was regaling the, all about the wall, why it went up, when it went up, and uh, the fact that it came down in just 10 years ago today. I'd been in uh, Berlin, I had the privilege of getting aboard a helicopter, the young warrant officer flew me all the way around the perimeter of the wall one time a few years ago. And yet I looked those glassy eyes out there and I was, it wasn't taken. But anyway, I sort of wrapped up my remarks. Then I guess it occurred to me uh, that 10 years ago these were 9 and 10 year olds and now they're sitting in college. And before that, when the wall went up, their parents weren't even born. So this is a tough message to carry. It's been alluded to by uh, General Lawson and, and, uh, and General Peck that it's a, it's a very difficult thing to make uh, make this thing note, uh, known to kids, to, to carry this message of, of reflection, to carry the importance of how free and safe we are for all the reasons uh, that we're free and safe. I uh, first began this thing, uh, this writing experience, and I called it Reflections of a Cold Warrior, the whole big 235,000 word thing. Chapter 5, General Doherty, you've got a copy of it there. Uh, but the other uh, the other nine chapters, uh, I really wanted to, to begin this whole historical perspective, but I labeled it and I went for the copyright for Reflections of a Cold Warrior. And I immediately got zapped. In fact, Rob Hoover called my attention to the fact that, uh, that Richard Bissell of uh, CIA fame had written the same book, uh, book by the same title. Unfortunately, he died before it got published, but Yale did publish it a few years ago, so I had to do some maneuvering and, and change the title. But I have ref referenced uh, uh, Bissell uh, in the book, and because uh, he was a great, great contributor, it's by the fact he got fired. But a lot of people got fired during the during the Cold War for all sorts of reasons and and what have you. So anyway, when the big thing gets published, and by the way, General Doherty, you've given me great encouragement doing this. Yale University Press uh, has a manuscript now, has a query, and hopefully their Russian Studies Center will uh, uh, get that sucker out. It won't be free. This is free, by the way. Uh, it's the best giveaway on the best giveaway list at our university. I gave them all the rights to the book. I didn't want any money. If you make money, you have to pay taxes. And so uh, uh, they have the book. And uh, it's for your writing. And Rob will tell you how to get a copy if you want to hear about the Cold Wars and read about some of your friends. I'm going to skip through everything Earl talked about and uh, try to get to the whole thing here. Uh, I think it's important with regard to the Cold Warrior one more time, and that's become a... Ed Harris, by the way, everybody knows Big Ed, really lacerated me a couple of years ago when I, I sent him some drafts of this stuff, and it had uh, the term Cold Warrior, and he said, where'd you come up with that? And I said, well, that's what we were. And he said, I never heard that before. And I said, well, that's what we were. I thought we were anyway. And so I, I've convinced him now that Cold Warrior is a good, accepted term, and it, it reflects all of us. But the Cold Warrior served during these 45 year periods and even served before and, and afterward uh, under what I've called a fragile Cold War uh, umbrella. Both sides, the Soviets and the US, learned to maneuver under that umbrella, began with the Berlin blockade and one of the, the largest airlift uh, life saving mercy missions in the history of our time. And then shortly after that, the first proxy war. Uh, sponsored by the Soviet Union and, and Mao Tsung in Korea. And we battled that to an impasse after, after three years. Then came the revolt in Hungary, in Budapest. 30,000 civilians were killed in two days in Budapest. Some of the kids, uh, 
I cover that in the other book. 14 and 50 year, year olds were jailed by the, uh, uh, by the Hungarian and the uh, Soviet police, put in jail until they turned 18. On their 18th birthday, they were executed. There are a thousand documented cases of 14, 15, 16 year olds arrested. Of course, Neji, the president of, at the time of Hungary, was taken back to Moscow on the pretense of making peace and uh, got a bullet in the head. Uh, then came Sputnik, U-2 uh, overflights, Gary Powers got shot down and, and scuttled the first major uh, summit meeting that Eisenhower had called. By the way, Gary Powers Jr. is creating a Cold War museum uh, in Virginia, in uh, Alexandria. And I've spoken to him several times. I put him in touch with some folks here and down at the Air University, but he seems to be a very bright, young, 40-year-old, uh, very proud of his father's service. And so Gary's working on that. If you have an opportunity to make contact with that, uh, entity, I'm, I'm not sure what their website is, but it's probably website, probably WW Cold War, but nevertheless, uh, Gary is trying to do this, not only in remembrance of his father, but just in remembrance of the Cold War and the Cold War itself. In Korea, to some degree, but in Vietnam, I think was the telling story uh, for the Cold War. In Korea, uh, some guys got called back to go do things outside the nuclear alert posture, but in Vietnam, uh, Strategic bomber, tanker, missile guys <coughs> suddenly found themselves in F-4s, 105s. I suddenly found myself out of a B-52 into a 141, and later in Goonie Birds and two tours. And then after it was all over, or when your tour was over, back to SAC and back to nuclear alert. That was the reward uh, for serving. But it worked. Uh, found out that bomber guys uh, or fighter guys could become bomber guys, bomber guys could become fighter guys. I didn't like the 141, despite the fact that P.K. Carlton tried to make it look like SAC. We still shook hands on the front of the nose wheel and said, are you going to fly? I'm out fly. And I just didn't like that. You know, I, I was so geared to the checklist and I couldn't even find one when I got in the cockpit. Wasn't quite that bad, but I'm telling you, flying from Dover to Anchorage to Saigon to uh, wherever else uh, with a guy in the right seat that you met about, you know, four or five hours ago was, uh, was a peculiar experience. I tried to cover a little bit in the, in the major piece about the domestic issues during the Cold War, and we had numerous domestic issues. It was an increasing, better informed public. Uh, the television media uh, helped us or didn't help us, served us as, didn't serve us as case may be. But we survived. Uh, I, tried to, I tried to talk about those others who served, uh, the wives, the two for the price of one. Believe it or not, I couldn't get very many wives to talk. Man, they talk like crazy at other places and OWC. I couldn't get very many to, to commit, but I have a few uh, excerpts uh, in here and in the, in the other piece. Uh, I don't think we give enough credit to those gals that stood back there and, and kept it going. Uh, my wife had not even been out of the United States, I don't think, I retired from SAC, and then I had to take her all over the world with my company to uh, show her what all those garden spots that I used to, uh, to go to. But finally, it, it came to a point in the early 80s, we elected a president who was committed uh, to bring it to a close. And uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, whether you believe in the Strategic Defense Initiative, whether you believe it was smoke and mirrors, uh, it worked. And the Soviets, I can tell you, the Russians, I can tell you today, are still just as concerned about it now as they were then. But the advent of the air launch cruise missile, the fact that we could spray that that whole area with standoff missiles, the introduction of the Alcom uh, into NATO, coupled with the specter of a, of a global shield, uh, just really uh, uh, brought them up short. Uh, the economic <coughs> situation, the uh, ideological strife in the Soviet bloc countries was coming unraveled. Berlin Wall had already come down. And then to throw a missile defense system at them. Uh, that, and, and coupled importantly with the advent of Mikhail Gorbachev, the first Soviet leader in history to have a, a college degree became it. He didn't last long, but he lasted long enough for he and, and uh, Reagan to put it together. And then George Bush completed the job. So my bottom line is that the Cold War didn't just end. We won it, and they know it, and they still know it uh, today. So in the main, I attempted to research a lot of, uh, a lot of material. Uh, believe it or not, you, you can't get in, in Russia 
virtually impossible even today, although I've not been back now in almost five years, to get a, a, a book of history or any sort of a document uh, printed in English. It just isn't done, wasn't permitted. <coughs> we were in Beijing a few years ago, and you can go into most any bookstore in Beijing and find an English-speaking section of books. I bought Mao's whole series of books. I haven't finished reading them yet, but I will one day and see if I can work them in someplace. But, uh, but not in Russia, not in Russia, not in English. It's a few English-speaking people, in fact, considerable number, depending on their uh, uh, their training, and a lot of them got a lot of training uh, in English. I had a, in our office in, uh, in Kiev, we had a young fella, uh, Sasha, commander in the uh, Soviet Navy, a picket ship uh, linguist, and uh, this young fella spent 12 years from, from Maine to Miami uh, in a picket ship, and uh, I, I got more, had more fun with uh, with Sasha and, and uh, trying to draw him out and, and take uh, stories from him. But this guy knew every pop song of the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. Uh, he knew uh, all of our newscasters by their first name. Uh, he knew more about Miami. He said, he said, Chris, I can take you any place in Miami. I've never been there, but I can take you in every street in Miami. He said, you want to know about Charleston? I can tell you everything about Charleston, South Carolina. And he could, uh, I mean, he, he had it. The other young fellow I had, uh, Victor Katzenoff. Victor uh, was a KGB school, uh, English school product. I could pick up uh, all 200 pounds of Victor and put him downtown Omaha. He's got the dialect instantly. I can take him back to Boston. He can pick it up. I can take him to Dallas, Texas. Victor could adapt to the situation, not only, not only with English, but with the culture. I've never, the most phenomenal guy I've ever seen. I took him to a meeting. I met with the MOD, General Tashinsky, in Minsk one day, the MOD for the Belarus uh, Department of Defense. And uh, he went around the room introducing his people, and I was about to introduce my people through the translator. And yet, who's he? And I said, he's my translator. Uh, he's with our company in Moscow. He said, out. He's from Moscow, out. <laughs> and I said, well, but I need him. He said, I'll give you a translator. So Victor had to leave the room. He wasn't very happy about it, but he left the room. Uh, the, uh, the Muscovites are not very popular as you uh, move around the other, uh, the other parts of the former Soviet Union. Well, I could spend uh, hours, and, and if I had the capability to put it down in, in print properly, I could <coughs> spend several hours on anecdotes about the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, a little bit about uh, the PRC, not to demean, not to make fun of, there are a lot of funny stories. I mean, they're hilarious stories that just uh, make you cringe because they're so pitiful. But the one, uh, one anecdote I'd like to leave you with occurred on my last night in Moscow in 1995, and I was going around, I was, went on consulting status with a company, and 23 trips was just about a wear out for me. And I, uh, we had a young fellow there that the, uh, our, Russian general manager had, had brought to me a couple of years before and asked me if we would take him on board as an administrator, sort of a bookkeeper. Uh, he said he's former military and uh, he's a good administrator. He had, and I said, well, is he KGB? He said, yes, sir, he is, but he's a good guy now. He's retired and what have you. And I said, well, that's fine. I said, you, you know, we don't, everything we're doing here is, is open for everybody to See and look, wasn't quite true, but it was close. Uh, <laughs> but so I agreed to take on Anatoly and make him uh, sort of the office manager he would. Turns out he was a retired colonel in the KGB and he had been uh, the administrative oversight. KGB covers everything, or did cover everything. Secret Police does it now. Uh, every business entity. And so we brought this joint venture together, MacAmnet, Moscow Andrew Communications Network. If you haven't heard of it, you probably haven't. We've only got $80 million in there trying to make a few pennies profit. But uh, so Anatoly would pick me up at the airport and land out at Sheremetyevo too, and he would meet me and drive me in. He always had a little gift for me. He didn't speak English. I didn't speak any Russian except to ask for food and where the bathroom is <coughs> and water and to say spasibo if, if it's good. Uh, but always had a little trinket for me, something going, something coming, stop at the kiosk, get a key ring, send a scarf home to my wife or something. 
So the night before I left, Anatoly came to me as I walked around the office. He handed me an envelope, a little manila envelope. And I, it was soft, wasn't ticking or anything like that. So I, it, I put it in my briefcase, went back to the room. Next day, I, I got on the uh, Lufthansa back to Frankfurt. And I reached and opened it up. And inside the envelope, wrapped in a piece of white paper, was Anatoly's shoulder boards, uh, full colonel, KGB, and had a little note wrapped around them. And uh, it said, for you, General Adams, love Anatoly. Well, the Cold War is over at different phases for different bits of time. Gene Habiger told me about flying the Bear Bomber over there a few years ago, and he said, when I got in that thing and rolling down the runway, I decided the Cold War must be over. I wouldn't be sitting here. And I felt the same way about Anatoly when he, uh, he gave me his shoulder boards. So I got back home to the company and I was telling this story around. And uh, of course the obvious question is, well, did you send him a pair of your shoulder boards? And I said, hell no, we won the war. I mean, for crying out loud. I mean, <laughs> this was Anatoly's commitment. But uh, there are other stories that, that can go on and on, but uh, the major part of it was the fact that uh, you served, you served with distinction, and uh, we served together, and it was the greatest times of our life. Uh, by the way.